It's my pleasure to introduce your guest speaker this week. It's Teamworks Director of International Development, Philip Mauscher. Hey, Philip, thanks for taking the time to be here today. Alan, thanks so much for having me and thanks so much for everyone in the audience for joining us today. So to start off, can you give us a background on your responsibilities here in Teamwork? So I joined Teamwork about three and a half years ago when we were only around 60 people in, in Cork, one office in Cork. I went from an executive assistant role to an interim people ops lead to um, the head of operations and now into my role as director of international development with a main focus on the US. I do understand my current responsibility is to mainly improve our um, customer experience by building out further customer-centric operations such as customer success, sales um, in the US. So I'm involved in recruitment, onboarding, enablement, and ensuring the cultural transfer between our headquarter to, to the US, to the Boston office that we um, launched last year. So in a nutshell, it's really making our people on the ground in the US successful. And then it's all around managing local uh, operations in terms of legal compliances, the workspace that we provide, um, building local networks with and partnerships with governmental bodies on the ground or our teamwork partners, channel partners, training partners. And then it's essentially as well, supporting our company strategy with local market insights. And then on the side, voluntarily sort of, I'm also running uh, with my colleague, Jill. We're both running the SaaS Network Ireland, which is a network of indigenous Irish SaaS companies to learn and grow um, together. I can imagine the, the kind of challenges imposed by COVID-19 and the resulting roadblocks that you've had to pay, um, that, that you've faced. So uh, with your, your key activities in mind, can you share your experience from the past three months? Yes, yeah, so I think one of the, the key areas that was impacted, definitely travel. So we, we had to stop visiting our customers, organizing local customer meetups or you know, organizing events with our partners. Um, personally impacted, obviously, by the travel uh, suspension into the US. So that's, that's why we're still kind of stuck here in Germany. We had to start hiring uh, and onboarding remotely. So there's been a couple of team members that have never seen the office, never met anybody physically you know, in, in teamwork. Uh, it's all been virtual. Uh, running our business, our operating model remotely, I think transferring our culture through a screen as well, uh, which has its challenges. And then on the SaaS network side, I think keeping the network up and running, supporting our members, running our events. Um, it's got its upsides as well. We had April Dunford, the, the author of Obviously Awesome and Position Consultant. We had her join from Toronto last week for an event, which probably wouldn't have happened if, you know, um, she could travel, she wouldn't have come to Ireland, I think, but it, it was a fantastic event um, online. So it's got its up and downs, so yeah, I guess as well. You did touch on um, culture there. So my next question there is, yeah. is just on culture. So a company like ours birthed in Ireland has a unique set of values, beliefs, and behaviors. Maintaining this culture can be a challenge as you scale internationally. So how did you address this challenge? Yeah, so I believe, Alan, the key is to provide a sense of belonging to everyone. And I get it, it's, that sounds super fluffy. So let me give you some examples. I think it starts with, with a vision, a purpose that everyone is bought into and that's constantly, constantly reiterated and communicated across the company. We do share our vision every quarter. Every quarter we do an, an, a quarterly kickoff where we share priorities for the next quarter, our vision, our values again. We share it on the first day when somebody joins Teamwork and I think we, we don't stop talking about it in our company handbook. And then secondly, I think it's important to celebrate our, our wins, our common wins. So for instance, we call out great staff behavior in our legend awards that we host every quarter or fantastic achievements in our wins room on Teamwork Chat. And then um, that's, that's, I think, that's a really good way of making your values more tangible as, as well. It's, it's one way, I think, to write it down, but it's another to show how they're actually exhibited within the company. And then uh, related to the latter as well, we have a company manual that describes who we are, what we stand for, what our values actually mean, what's expected from everybody um, and where to go to, you know, if you're looking for something. We also have a ministry of happiness, as we call it, group, social kind of group, voluntary group within the business um, that's organizing social events. And we push to have representatives from all offices in that ministry of happiness as well. And then um, on top of that, I think we do try to replicate our operating model, our values, our activities, our benefits that gel us together in every office location. So it starts with the, the office design, right? The look and feel uh, around the place, the benefits that you get. 
uh, events. We have a Grand Council event every year where we fly all staff into our headquarters and for Christmas the same thing. We do annual planning as well. We have monthly show and tells that are streamed at the moment. And then I think locally uh, in the Boston office, we try to get all US staff together once a quarter just for feedback and planning sessions, showing your work, talking about the vision, making sure everyone understands what's going on and simply have fun together, right? Gel together. We also go to conferences together. We learn together. We run an internal blog um, called In The Works, where we give a stateside update every month with introductions to new team members and an overview of simply what's happening, what everyone's working on. If um, there is any founders or CEOs listening today, I think it's super critical. The one advice I could give is super critical to show your face, show yourself a couple of times a year in, in those offices and spend time with your teams. And even if it's just a simple get together, talking about what's working well, what's not working well, listening to that feedback and acting on it, that, that can be super valuable. Uh, when we actually onboard new staff, we organize a coffee with the founders, uh, which we move to virtual now. I think that's a, that's a great start. And then um, on the flip side as well, that's just kind of bringing our culture over, you know, into new locations. But I guess it's also important to adjust to the local culture as well. So in terms of language, communication style, norms and rituals that are very specific to that location, some preferences, and then simple things like time difference or local holidays. So don't schedule your, you know, catch up or important meetings uh, in the Irish morning hours when you know there is somebody on the way, US West Coast that actually needs to join. So just if, if you're unsure, I guess simply ask your, your employees um, for feedback and, and act on it. So to sum it up, I guess the key is really have a vision, keep the engagement up, keep the communication channels open between all offices, reiterate that vision and your values, your top priorities. Constantly celebrate your common wins together, learn from failures together. And I think one thing that really helps us there is our operating model, the US uh, as well. Just moving on to the next question, you've been integral in deploying a business system that we've, or that's called EOS here in Teamwork. Correct. And it's become a huge component of our culture and productivity. So can you share a broad overview uh, of EOS for anybody who's unfamiliar with it? Yeah, uh, thanks Alan. So that's something I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, it's, it's been a tremendous project and it's still ongoing. Um, EOS stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. So what it is, it is it's a simple framework to run your, your business. There is six components to it. Um, and if you're okay, I'll, I'll go into a bit of detail there. Um, that, have the goal of transforming your organization, organization into a well-oiled machine. So there's the vision piece, um, developing your, your values, your long-term plan, a tactical outlook as well in terms of one-year plan, quarterly priorities, and then also being aware of the obstacles that are you know, on your way or untapped opportunities that you know they're there, but you can't focus on them right now, but at least you have them written down in they're constantly in front of you. And then the important piece is obviously to share this, have it shared and understood by the entire company. That's the first piece. The second piece is people, which is all about having the right people in the right seat. Um, then data, so tracking your progress. Are you actually making progress to, towards your quarterly priorities, towards your annual plan, your three-year plan, your 10-year target, and tracking that every week and taking corrective action uh, on the company level, but also on the individual team level. Uh, the fourth component is process, and I think that's more critical than ever um, while everyone's working remotely and in different time zones probably. Having your core processes written down, documented, and shared and followed by everyone in the company. And then also there is the component of issues, which are the things that are actually holding you back, right, to achieve your long-term goals. Um, and it's important to get to the root cause of, the cause of those uh, in order to solve them. And then the last piece of EOS is traction, where everything kind of comes together. So it's about setting your key priorities, and the EOS calls it rocks, right, uh, to focus on at the company level, but then also on the individual team level, and then having productive meetings uh, across the business. I believe the need for EOS for teamwork really arose when we were at about 100 people, and we knew that we needed something, you know, in order to, to scale uh, and get alignment across the company, have transparency, accountability, and focus into one model that's actually gelling the co whole company together. Ever since we impl implemented EOS, um, we have a vision place, we, we reiterate it, we 
actually change the values, um, made them shorter. We identified process gaps, right? Um, we built a focus um, in terms of 10 year target, three year picture where we want to get to, uh, which kind of makes us you know, more, more focused, obviously, more driven and prevents us from pursuing that shiny stuff that's, that's also out there. And then um, I guess we have planning meetings on a quarterly basis and annual basis on the company level, but then also within each team. Obviously, there's, there's definitely challenges, right, um, in, in rolling this out and managing it and running it within the company. And it's the constant refinement and ongoing process. But I believe the major benefit of having one operating model in place is just that alignment, that accountability and that focus of, of everybody in the company. Now that we understand the, the concept behind the system or framework, can you share your experience in maintaining EOS during the pandemic? Yeah, I think, to be honest, Alan, I don't think any anything changed, right? Um, one day we just all grabbed our laptops and charging cables and started working from home and kept going, right? I think the biggest change was obviously, yeah, not having face-to-face uh, -face meetings anymore. So our weekly meetings, quarterly meetings couldn't happen in person. That's where we moved to video. And I, I guess there's a bit of a fatigue that kind of crept in and we knew we had to accommodate for people's challenges at home as well, especially people with kids. So for instance, what we did in our Q2 planning in March, we stretched it out over five days. So we had five afternoons where we came together as a leadership team and planned together. And we just, we just did the same in June um, over two days. And I guess we're, we're just using our own products to run US within Teamwork. To give you some examples there, we can level 10 meetings. So they're called level 10s because you rate them towards the end and hopefully you achieve a, a 10 out of 10. Um, we've moved them uh, to virtual and we run the agenda within spaces. One plugin for spaces, the, the sync between Teamwork and Teamwork spaces, the task uh, the to do is in there. Uh, to do plugin that was actually built based on the feedback that we got from from teams running on their their weekly level tens, and they needed that sync. So that's just kind of where we built that. And then um, if we meet on video. We we just started meeting on chat video, which is in beta at the moment and improves daily, which is awesome. And then our quarterly rocks, we document them in Teamwork as well. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, one way is probably having a project as a rock, as your, your quality priority, and then working with the portfolio view to um, report on it, whether it's on track, off track, complete, incomplete, or like we do it, we actually have one project and then tasks as rocks and subtasks as kind of you know, smaller del deliverables uh, for those rocks. And then we work with our board view triggers, um, custom fields as well to report on progress. And I think one thing that's really, really um, good within the product as well is dependencies. So we have dependencies. If one rock, one priority of, of one team is dependent on another team's is, um, rock, well, then we, we implement those dependencies uh, to make sure that we are constantly on track. And if every, every, anything moves off track, we can take corrective actions immediately. Rocks can also be formulated in spaces, so they can be fleshed out a little bit more there so and shared with everybody in the company, so that way everyone's in the in the loop, what's going on. Same with processes, right? We document all our processes, SOPs, etc., in spaces, and they can, if there's any changes, they can be pushed out through required reading to uh, everybody uh, in the company. So um, I believe we, we have all the products to run um, our business uh, and within that operating model, US. So Moving to remote, that shift actually went pretty uh, pretty much seamless. You mentioned a lot of useful ways that our suite helped you deploy EOS. Are there any other processes from t the Teamwork suite that enable you to perform your other responsibilities as well? Yeah, I think the golden rule at the moment is when you're working remotely is if it's not in Teamwork and we're in Teamwork, it just simply doesn't exist, right? So spaces, document all your SOPs, quality priorities, cross-functional documentation, our internal blog, obviously, for more transparency and what's going on. I think templates are, are really good there. And then um, the integration between teamwork and teamwork spaces for tasks is pretty helpful for regular team meetings, to-dos, running through those to-dos. And then for a culture or just fast collaboration, transparency, teamwork chats, we have a work from home channel where everybody you know, can post photos of their dogs and 
you know, we run weekly quizzes or challenges, um, prizes to win in there as well. A water cooler channel that we have, um, we can have just discussions around what's going on. Company news where we share our updates. We have a staff university channel where we share, you know, what's going on um, in the SaaS world and share the learning. And then specific project channels as well that help us to, to keep the communications within the, the project itself. And to manage events like the SaaS network event, for example, we we use teamwork as well. Um, if anybody is interested in learning more about EOS, we are, we're happy to pass on those those documents uh, after this session as well. But uh, just diving back to the start of the session there, Philip, you referenced that certifications are a key responsibility of yours. Um, could you share some insights on what it's like to meet the policies um, of a foreign market? Okay, yeah. So to give you an example, in the US, if you're working with health healthcare providers, um, if they need to host any health data uh, or patient data, you know, within your platform, well, you need to be HIPAA compliant. And I think another big project I was involved in, uh, which was fantastic, uh, cross team kind of cross functional uh, efforts, which we delivered within a very short time and managed entirely as well through, through teamwork was our ISO 27001 2013 certification. Uh, just to build on HIPAA uh, as well. And ISO, I guess, International Standard for Information Security, is just another extension um, for compliances in the key markets that we're in and shows that we are truly able to, in, to provide an enterprise uh, solution. Globally, we're seeing budgets tighten and spend is reduced. Have you introduced any cost-saving measures for your international growth activities? I think organically, what we were forced through was no more travel, so no more no more travel co cost at the moment. I think in terms of office space in Boston, we we got a pretty decent deal. We moved in with a fellow company called Profitwell, and if there's anybody listening now, many thanks again for taking us in and getting us uh, set up. Certainly, a consideration is to to get a bit more of a hybrid space going, where we'll have a couple of team members coming in two or three times a week and then, you know, working remotely the, the other um, times, but we haven't figured it out completely yet. The offices are still closed. Um, I think one thing we did was consolidate a couple of our key suppliers into global providers just to get better service, you know, in all our lo office locations and a couple of cost savings going. Anybody setting up, I think one advice is find a flexible space, uh, whether it's it's in terms of co-working or just join another company by asking around, right? What we did before we moved over to US, we talked to a lot of companies, SaaS companies that we knew they made that move over already. And we asked them about their pitfalls, how they applied, you know, payroll, um, employment, uh, law, et cetera, and workspace, finding workspace as well, just to get a, get a kind of ballpark around prices and, you know, um, so that's how we got our space as well, just by simply asking around. We've covered a lot of your current and past challenges, but can you share some exciting initiatives that you've got lined up for the near future? Yeah, I think going forward, we'll, we'll keep doubling down and strengthen our CS and customer success and sales team in North America, just to deliver a really great customer experience from the time people engage with our website to when they talk to our sales staff. Um, and then hopefully, you know, becoming successful with our product and getting most value out of it. We heard from our customers over and over again that it is extremely valuable for them to have a bit more of a personal relationship with us, having those on-site visits um, organized for them, and we just want to expand on those. And then I think we've already worked with um, Enterprise Ireland and Invest, no Invest Northern Ireland, really great governmental bodies that help Irish companies getting set up in the US. So we want to exploit, you know, the opportunities, new up market opportunities in terms of a couple of outcome campaigns, maybe industry thought leadership events locally and virtually with those bodies as well. Once we're allowed to, hopefully in the near future, we want to bring our entire US team together because we've, we've had some recent hires and they've never seen any of us in person and never seen the office. Bring our customers together as well, once again, to the, the deliver valuable, uh, meaningful events from like small breakfast to bigger, bigger customer meetups. And then I think further down the line, we want to continue the localization into other languages as well, like Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, and German. We've already translated our website recently, and we just want to extend on that. Uh, one thing I'm really excited about, which is an internal thing, 
Um, we can't do it in person, obviously, this year, but we are going to host our company-wide Grand Council um, virtually by the end of July. That's just been announced this week, and I'm glad we're, we're doing this because it's part, really a part of our DNA at Teamwork. Fantastic. So uh, this is my last question before we dive into the Q&A from the audience. Uh, well, so were there any other challenges or insights that you'd like to share from the past couple of months? I guess while it's been you know critical for a lot of companies out there to reprioritize, re-strategize based on the current circumstances for the longer term, absolutely. I think it's also equally important to break that down into smaller steps, smaller wins, smaller deliverables that you can track. Um, I think it's more critical than ever to over communicate. If you think you're communicating enough at this stage, just do more of it, right? Because uh, it's so critical to keep your staff members in the loop of what's happening in the company, where the company is going, how we're doing, um, and then listening to feedback as well. So try to listen to your staff members, to your customers, and act on that feedback. In terms of hiring, I think obviously, unfortunately, a lot of people have been impacted by this crisis. So in the tech industry, obviously, as well. So, so there is a great talent pool out there of, and, and awesome people available. You might want to rethink your hiring strategy and your office strategy as well, and potentially hire in different locations where, or remotely entirely, right, where you've never thought of you would before. So that's, that's kind of the, to sum it up. So just to move on to the Q&A, our first question here is from Phil. So welcome to the webinar, or sorry, from Phil, from Will. Well, uh, he's just that. asking, <laughs> uh, thanks for sharing, Philip. Uh, he's learned a lot about your role. Would you recommend any books or resources related to your field? Yeah, I think in terms of international development, and we talk about culture a lot, right? One book I recently um, listened to, and I'm, I think it's, it's awesome, is What You Do Is Who You Are by Ben Horowitz. And then there's a couple of others, you know, if you're if you're looking at expanding into new markets, how you want to position yourself. April Dunford's um, obviously awesome and her 10 step positioning process. If you just answer those questions, you've actually done your due diligence in order to enter that new market. Behind the Cloud by Mark Benioff, really good, good um, book on the Salesforce journey and you know the, the pitfalls they ran into, things that they did really well um, to grow. Um, there's one in terms of marketing as well and different channels um, to, to look into. And a good model of kind of an onion model of experimentation and doubling down on things that work is traction how any startup can achieve explosive customer growth. And that's by Justin Mares and Gabriel Weinberg. Um, a recent one that just came out, all about customer success, focusing on the customer is the customer success e economy by the folks from Gainsight. So Alison Pickens and Nick Mita from Gainsight, really good book. And I guess other resources I would recommend as well, if you're in the, in the SaaS space are Jason Lemkin, follow, follow Jason Lemkin and his SaaS term. Really good content, blog content and podcast. Hitten, Hitten Shah uh, from Product Habits. He's got an amazing newsletter. So okay. sign up for that one. David mm -hmm. Scott, Matrix Partners. He's got a zero to 100 growth academy and there's awesome videos, especially if you're starting out, what to look out for in each phase of your business as well. And I follow um, uh, this South African uh, guy, Andrew Michael, churn.fm. They do a lot about customer experience and customer churn. Uh, from various tech uh, businesses. So even if you're not in the tech industry, I think there's a lot of learnings in there. So those resources would be the ones I could certainly <laughs> recommend. That's a, a lot of resources. And uh, I think you've, you've answered one of these other questions as well, just from Stephanie here. She's just mm -hmm. saying, hi, Philip, you underst uh, she understands that SaaS Network Ireland is a community of Irish businesses, but would you recommend any other SaaS events or organizations that you can join? Or sorry, yeah, that you can join. Definitely. Um, I, th I don't, there is not a specific network for, for SaaS in, in Europe, obviously. There's a community and SaaS doc uh, in Ireland. They're, they're yeah. or all over the world as well now. They're very, very great. And um, SaaS for obviously Jason Lemkin on, on the state side. Mm -hmm. Fantastic content and a great conference every year. Um, and then if you want to get into like very specific functions like Customer success, for, for instance, there's a customer success Europe group. They're on LinkedIn as well. They run regular events and they have a forum for CS professionals. I would definitely recommend them. That, that's kind of it, to be honest. Yeah, that's, that's plenty. Don't worry, there's, there's loads of learning there. <laughs> so 
Um, th this next question is from Kirsten, and she's saying Hello. thanks for sharing, Philip. Uh, she's enjoying the series a lot. Uh, she's asking just a question here on the, the certifications. What is the, the typical turnaround time for an ISO certification? I think that depends. Um, if you're a very small team, 20 to 50 people, I would say, you can easily do it within six months, right? But um, we did it for 250 staff, which was a bit of a bigger change management process. So it took us around eight months in total. There is great you know, partners that you can uh, work with out there, consultancies that help you in terms of starting with your gap analysis, assessing the risks you know, that you have within your business, getting a structure set up to uh, document all of your processes and I guess the compliances that you have to fulfill to certain statements um, within the, the ISO. There's around 133 controls within there that you have to put in place. One thing is documenting, but then also you have to prove that you are operationally able um, to put these into practice. So I would say as a rule of thumb, if you have above 50 staff, it could take you six to 12 months. Um, if you're less and really ambitious, you have the resources in place as well in terms of people and the financial resources. It's not a cheap undertaking, by the way. Um, then, yeah, you could you could definitely do it within six months, but that's that's very ambitious. The last question for today, and it's from a series regular, it's from Carlos here. I think this question was spurred on from the, the translation that you mentioned, but he's asking, are there any plans to expand Teamworks operations to other countries, for example, a Teamwork office in Latin America? Okay, really good question, on Carlos. Um, I think there's, there's awesome locations, there's great stuff happening in tech, for example, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile as well, right? There's hubs popping up all over the place and really good talent actually coming out of, the, out of these places too. We actually have a couple of staff members, for instance, in, in Argentina and Brazil at this stage. At the moment, it's only satellite offices, to be honest. I think we are focusing for the, the short and sort of midterm on the English speaking countries in the US, Australia, um, UK, Ireland, and then Europe as well. But yes, I mean, as, as we grow and expand, you know, into Latin America as well, definitely an opportunity, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, promise anything at this stage. Yeah, or discount it as well. Exactly. Okay, guys, <laughs> so that, that's it for all of the questions today. They were a lot of fun. Thank you all very much for those. Uh, Philip, is there anything else that you'd like to share just before we sign off? No, look, um, if, thanks so much for uh, everyone for joining today and listening to me um, if you have any follow-on questions i'm on linkedin um, i'm on on support at teamwork.com as well ask for me ask for philip if you have any queries and more than happy to share any learning resources or processes you know internally how we got our compliances going or foster culture across our offices more than happy to connect with you